spirit back to the land is something that is crucial for all of us to move forward. So what you're doing in bringing people together, um, not because of money, not because of politics, not because of rebellion, not because of extremists, but because of spirit, something that no one in the alphabet agencies can be against or claim to be against openly at least, what you're doing in bringing people together on the thing that unites them in spirit is history, Ray. It is history and it has come. So thank you for what you're doing. Can I, can I say one more thing? Yeah. One thing is that if we can stop the chain of hatred and start from this moment, don't forget the past, but just go on from here and stop and walk together. This this could be this we could go to the to the fifth level easily within within a short time. You talk about Mars, and I wanted to get on to that. Um, last last week you were talking about Mars, and that was me, Central mm-hmm. Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Um, there already there's already something up there. That planet was an inhabited planet. You know it, and I know it. Mm-hmm. And there's still all we have to do is go up there, rework the machine that's up there. And and it all needs is you know some work. It's there, and the moon will come together quickly, because all we have to do is move them together, and just you know it, as you said, it will form itself mm-hmm. as it spins around. Mm-hmm. But yeah, once all all we have to do is use our minds, stop fighting each other, and everybody every every single person has a purpose in this world. Mm-hmm. Okay, and allow them and help them grow with it. Well, that's a $64,000 challenge. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ray, good on you. All right. All right, thank you, Ray. All right, now um, real quick question back over on the chat, then we'll get to Gypsy Rose on the phone lines. Um, will God allow man to destroy the planet and life on it completely, or... Uh, you think a little here, a little there, or what is your opinion on that? Well, I think uh, I think we've already proven that that the destiny that many thought we would be heading towards has changed, and I think that is reflected in in a broad sense. So what I'm referring to is the inevitable uh, self destruction through our own whatever stupidity, infection of mind virus or, or, or whatever group of things. I, I, I know and I absolutely empathize with, with people at every age that now see that the climactic issues and environmental is, is, is absolutely uh, vital. And so I think it's great to see people dive into wanting to see environmental change and the stop of the rape and pillaging of the planet. I mean, this is crucial. This is what we're just talking about with Ray, is is healing the planet. But I think knowing who we are, what we are, has been missing the equation. If we don't know who we are, if we don't know what we are, if we don't know why we've come here, if we don't know why things happen, then we certainly can't change it. And I, I don't believe at all that it, it is inevitable that that the... Homo sapiens species will destroy a planet. And say, will God allow um, us to destroy a planet? I, I would say allow means that, that our will can be taken away from us. And I think the opposite is the case. We have always had the will to determine our own destiny. It's a bit like you go and see a fortune teller and they tell you that, that um, something bad will happen. The way I interpret it doesn't mean that the the event is inevitable. In many cases, if there is a genuine clairvoyance, it is to avoid the inevitable. We get the warnings so that we can avoid the inevitable. And I think we've been given the warnings. And I also think that we are changing the future so we will avoid the inevitable. But I, I can't take away, no one can take away, and certainly the divine can never interfere with free will because the free will you have is the free will that keeps the universe ticking along. And if, if you don't understand what I'm saying there, then I really urge the the person that asked that question, go and have a read 
of those things, the journey of UCA, the paintings of Eucadia, and, uh, and actually read these canons we've, we've talked about tonight because it will fill in the blanks for you to understand the meaning of what I've just said. Okay? All right, very good. Thank you, Frank. Uh, now we'll get to Tipsy Rose on the phone lines, and we've got Greg uh, in the wings from there. Let's see. Tipsy Rose, can you hear us? Hello, Frank. This is Linda from Idaho. Hi, Linda. Hi. Very nice to speak with you. I had the privilege this last weekend of working the Ironman competition held in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Um, people from all over the globe come for this. Ah. And I'm very happy to tell you that I had the privilege of working on four Australian people. And it was very cool. And the rest were from Washington or California. And I did pass your websites on to them. And my gift of healing touch with reflexology and uh, transferring my knowledge learned from Greg Pappas and you since November 7th. My destiny has always been love. And those who haven't had love or have lost love, I do that with my healing. And I want to thank you very much for the knowledge that you have brought to my life. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for, I think it's wonderful to, to hear the gifts and, and to, to also hear on how you connect and give back to others, Linda. So uh, the, the thanks comes back to you as well. Um, look, we all, we all have a part to play, and I, and I say this, you know, why I change the role I'm, I'm playing at the end of the year is because there are so many wonderful people. And, you know, sometimes you've got to step back from the message and step back from what's happening to allow things to happen. You know this with the healing. Sometimes you've got to allow, when you're doing the healing, you're really being a conduit from something greater than yourself to communicate to something else. So mm -hmm. good on you, Linda, and thank you for passing that on. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, Frank. Good night. Thank you, Linda. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get to Greg. Let's see. Greg, can you hear us? Are you there? Hi, Terry Lynn. Hi, Frank. Hi, Greg. Hi, Greg. Well, I um, wasn't going to chime in tonight, and I really wanted to just follow up on a couple things about the commercial court system. and. Uh, about not giving them an opportunity to make any more money. And then I have a question for you, Frank, before I go. Uh, yeah, sure. just, just wanted to throw this out there um, that – and I, maybe this is an explanation now as to why – well, first of all, I just want to clarify, I agree with you and Ron on the issue that um, case law is not a winner, will never win. In fact, uh, Bob, who used to, who's been on the calls a lot, a friend of Ron's and mine, um, was in a case with him where, where he used the ultimate case law – in his argument, filed it into the court properly using both U.S. Supreme Court law and uh, Washington State uh, Supreme Court uh, decisions, not just case law. And um, the prosecutor, who was about 27 years old and a, probably within five-year graduate of law school, four-year graduate of law school, cited cases that were completely irrelevant to his argument and to the case, and the judge ruled in his favor on every single ridiculous point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a scene out of Laura Biding Citizen. Did you? You may not have seen that film, but it was a bit of a Hollywood uh, tr trashy film. But did you ever okay. see or hear that film? No, but I will now. I'll go look it up. Yeah, he's a, it's a, yeah there's a scene in that film uh, where uh, the, the fellow is out for revenge, so he's basically killing people off, which is not a very good thing. But no, no. The, the, the point the point is that he's he's in the he's in the uh, courtroom and he's up there for, for like triple murder charges. And he starts qu quoting um, what sounds like citations to the judge, and the, and he and he's so confident, he's such a charismatic character. The judge says, "Yes, no, I grant you bail." And then he looked at the judge and said, "I just what I just told you was complete rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> complete and utter rubbish." But it was all about the confidence and the and the charisma and the BS factor. So yeah, uh, I understand what you're saying. And, and that unfortunately is what case law is all about. I mean, people think, and because they say that a case is, you know, a citation, it there becomes a reference. It's effectively like saying, 
you know, it, it, it is uh, the interpretation of the law. It's all complete rubbish, crap. Yeah. It's absolutely crap. Right. You can find, actually, equal number of arguments on both sides of an issue. So if you have your arguments, some people come along from the other side, if they do their homework, and they'll have an equal amount. And it's just who has, the, uh, I guess, the persuasion or who paid the judge the largest amount of money before mm-hmm. the case started. And another area in that is uh, Robert Fox down in Texas. He won another case at the end of May. And, and, he, and he, he's the best at going to court and arguing. But everybody who tries to follow Robert's process when they when they get into court, if they don't have his confidence, they get eaten alive. So, you know, I would never tell people to go into court like Robert does. In fact, Robert's so powerful now that the feds won't, not one federal agency will prosecute him because they're tired of losing money on every case they prosecute him on. But so, but the rest of us, we better we better do what Ron was talking about. And and I just wanted to clarify that. And and also, if if if, if in my case, I've made it not cost effective for them to come after me. So it's the reason there's been. I would imagine some warrants not issued for me when I've done stupid things in the past is because I've challenged judges in the past and it wasn't worth it to them to, to get me in there. But it's, it's, a, it's a risk. It's not worth taking. And, and I would just tell people not to, not to do that. Um, on the elocution, I'm, I'm trying to get all my notes together on that, and I'll, I think I'm going to do an audio recording with Gerald and then build a transcript or an outline from that for the, for the, the documents. But my question, Frank, is related to what transpired after I'm in Coeur d'Alene also, and after Iron Man on uh, um, on Sunday, um, Sunday morning, uh, we 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 would think that because it's Iron Man and it's national or worldwide broadcasting, um, that there would be beautiful air, especially since we live in a beautiful area in the country. And um, but the aircraft were out there at around 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, and they weren't successful because the wind was blowing. But later on that night, they were successful in leaving a, a, a blanket sky out, and they sprayed for about 36 hours straight without a reprieve. And my question mm-hmm. is um, not so much about the chemicals and the things that they were spraying on us, but about this Planet X, the Nibiru um, issue that's taking place right now. And, and, I, and I liken the Elenin aspect to ELE, Extinction Level Event. I don't think there's mm-hmm. a name of Russian astronomer. I just think they're trying to scare everybody with the ELE, you know, from uh, um, Deep Impact from 1998 mm-hmm. or 99 with Morgan Freeman. But um, ironically, a black president, we have a black president now. It's, uh, mm-hmm. no public concern. notice, yeah. yeah. Yeah, public notice. So my question is, um, is uh, and, and we have JPL misinformation, and I've never been able to get a straight answer. I had some sources I was trying to get through to JPL, and nothing's come back to me yet. But um, So based on all this and, and our intention, um, is, I mean, is, do you have an inkling any more d- data or knowledge on what's really happening right now as to why the 36 or more hours of straight aerial bombardment on us and stuff like that? I mean, it's just... Well, can, can, can you... Well, I think the answer is, look, um, remember I said that, that, that World War II was a deliberate conscious end of the world for them. It was a deliberate and conscious... Um, uh, attempt to fulfill uh, their covenant so they had free reign. They didn't want to if you think about the evolution of it the um, particular families and this was a, a sub-segment of them a particular families originally were became enslaved to the system uh, even though other families were, if you like, the the overarching leaders. These families, in terms of the Roth and others, who ended up leaving as Mennonites and, and becoming the Rothschilds, or we know them as the Rothschild, um, they flipped the switch. And instead of being the servants to the treasury, they ended up in the servants to the kings. Uh, in World War One, they succeeded in killing those that they served and became the masters. Now this was such a successful identity theft that they decided to go for the whole hog and go for the grand prize of destroying the Talmud. Yeah, fulfilling the Talmud. I see now. And and that's what they did. Now that required a three and a half year tribulation which didn't finish till the end of 1944 which is why in in a moment of desperation they had to a point of complete incompetent in uh, in managing the uh, the military response in Europe. 